slug survey, wanted to start off with this uh, figure of merit for integral field spectroscopy surveys. So it shows velocity resolution on the y-axis and how far out you go in a, in a galaxy in terms of effective radius. So all the different surveys have their own value add, if you like. And we've heard from some talks about manga data and we've heard about the massive survey. I'm going to talk about the slug survey. So our value add is that we have very good velocity resolution. We go out quite a way, almost to three effective radii with the stars. That's that point there. And then we also have this X factor of the globular clusters that Gene spoke about. We go out to about eight or ten effective radii. So here's the slugs survey. It's 25 nearby early type galaxies in that sort of mass range there. Virtually all of them have their inner regions probed by the Atlas 3D survey. Very nearby. Range of environments, but of course you know, only 25 galaxies. A bunch of papers to date, and the overall aim is to help us understand early type galaxy formation. So there's some pretty pictures, just little postage stamps of what the galaxies look like. And a quick rundown of some of the sort of specs of the, of the survey. So as I said, we're looking at galaxy starlight out to about three effective radii, and globular clusters out to about 10 effective radii. We use the calcium triplet lines of, of D, um, using DMOS in the near infrared. Gives us very good uh, resolution. It's a very stable spectrograph. And from that, we can obtain uh, velocity, sigma, the higher order moments, H3, H4, in 2D maps, and also get some metallicity 2D maps. And we've got about 4,000 globular cluster spectra to date. And that was mostly the focus of Gene's talk. So I'm not going to talk much about uh, globular clusters, but focus on the starlight today. Here's what we do. There's a DMOS footprint, and there's four DMOS masks that we tile around a galaxy, getting the starlight in the inner regions and the globular clusters further out. This is a plot of all the globular clusters that we've obtained. So there's 4,000 of them here, all the galaxies stacked together, just showing you their, their velocity relative to the systemic velocity of the galaxy as a function of effective radius. So you can see we've got, got globular clusters going out to at least 10 effective radii, sometimes some of them even out to 20 or 30 effective radii for our 25 galaxies. And here's one of the uh, recent results that we've obtained by using the motions of the globular clusters to measure the dynamical mass of, these, of our galaxy sample. So what I'm showing here is the X-ray luminosity um, against stellar mass the total mass within five effective radii, so this is what we measure from our globular cluster motions, and the virial mass, which we just extrapolate from the, um, from the five RE mass. So really focus in on this middle panel. The colored points are our galaxies, plus a few from the literature. They're coded by their light profile. So these galaxies, the high mass ones, have cores in their optical surface brightness when you look at them with HST. These galaxies down here have cusps. We get a nice uh, correlation. Luminosity going as mass to about the cube power. Quite a tight relation here, those colored points. And one of the nice things too is that we managed to put on the simulations of CHOI. So this is a cosmological simulation that where the AGN feedback is mechanical feedback, which makes a big difference compared to the th thermal feedback in their model. And I think as far as I'm aware, this is the first time that cosmological simulations have been able to predict the X-ray luminosity of elliptical galaxies as a function of their, of their dynamical mass uh, in a correct way. They've often been out previously deviated by factors of 10, 100, or even 1,000. So just moving on now to the starlight. So we, get, we can create these 2D velocity maps for our galaxies. Here's one example of how things have changed. So this is an integral field unit view of an early type galaxy. You can see some rotation going on in the central regions. This would be about 20 by 20 arc seconds in the central regions of this particular interesting galaxy. And here is the view that we have using DMOS as effectively as an integral field unit. So if you've got good eyesight at the back there, you'll see that little, that rotation in that previous slide there. So that rotation's going on right in there. So it's also very interesting. So the galaxy right in the inner parts is rotating that way. 
but the vast bulk of the galaxy, the bulk of the mass is rotating this way. And that's the isophote of the galaxy. So in fact, it's not really um, rotating. It's actually rolling this galaxy, if you want to think of it that way. Here's the um, specific, specific angular momentum profiles for our galaxies, just showing the inner regions at the moment. So this was the parameter defined by the Atlas 3D survey. And we've coded the blue galaxies to be the so-called centrally fast rotators, the red ones to be the centrally slow rotators. So what happens when you probe out to three or four effective radii? That's what happens. So for our sample, the slow ones remain pretty slow. The fast ones, well, some of them remain fast or get even faster, but occasionally a few of them decline. So the centrally fast rotators have a diversity of angular momentum profiles. So the main part of my talk, I wanted to talk about assembly histories. So in 2014, uh, Thorsten Nab had this paper which showed that the assembly histories of galaxies are preserved in the 2D kinematics of those galaxies in present day, the present day simulated galaxies. So from an observer's point of view, um, we'd like to be able to reconstruct the assembly history of our, of our favorite local galaxy. So I'll just show you what was in Thorsten's, uh, Thorsten Nab's paper. So this is the basic uh, picture that they have for early type galaxy formation. You have this, this first phase that forms early on and then the second uh, accretion phase where galaxies are accreting into the halo and building up the size and the mass of the galaxy as time moves on. So they identified six assembly pathways according to the different kinematics that their simulated galaxies had. And so you can see from A through F and different types of, of merger, whether it involved gas or did not involve gas, and whether it led to a galaxy that was centrally fast rotating or centrally slow rotating. So here's the diagnostics they used. They looked at these higher order moments of, of the velocity, line of sight velocity. So that's the H3 and H4 as a function of V over sigma. So here are their six classes here and the distributions that they have in these types of diagrams. So you can see, for example, classes C, E, and F are pretty hard to discriminate in this kind of H3 versus V over sigma, but you can discriminate them quite well against the A and B class. And then there's two other diagnostics that they had. They looked at the lambda profile. This angular momentum is a function of uh, effective radius. And again, so here the, the profiles are colored by their six assembly classes. And finally, they also looked at the 2D maps of velocity and velocity dispersion. <laughs> so using all that, they put all of their galaxies into these six different classes. Here's one of their summary plots. So this is plotting the, the in situ fraction against galaxy mass here, and again coded by their six different types of assembly classes. So the galaxies up here have a high in situ fraction. They tend to be the low mass galaxies. They're classified as A and B. And galaxies down here have a very high exit to a high accretion fraction. They tend to be the high mass galaxies, classified classes sort of D, E, F. So we've essentially done the same thing with our sample. We have angular momentum profiles for our galaxies. We have 2D velocity and velocity dispersion maps. And we can also form H3 and H4 against V over sigma for our sample of galaxies. And then we compare them with these kinematic predictions from the Thorsten Lab uh, models. So here's a summary plot of, of what we found. Here I'm just showing uh, lambda within one effective radius against the stellar mass of our galaxies. Coded them again by the same, same classes as, uh, as in the NAB paper. So you can see that most of our galaxies are, are dark blue here, so they're colored, they're an A-class galaxy. We have a few B-class and then one or two of the other classes. Now, you've no doubt, like me, forgot what they all stand for. <laughs> so here they are. So, for example, we find the majority of A-class, which means they are formed by gas-rich minor mergers, with a few that we might have in the category B, which are also gas-rich, but in this case, it's a, it's a late-time major merger. 
that gives rise to the galaxy. So they both have centrally fast rotation. There's been some dissipation involved to give you that fast central disk-like rotation. But in the case, say, of B in the outer parts, it's still spinning up in the outer parts due to that, that major merger. So the summary of that was, as I said, the most common pathway that we found for our sample of galaxies around 10 to the 11 solar masses was this class A. 14 of our 20, 24 of our galaxies were classified as class A. So they're generally centrally fast, disk-like. They have slowly rotating halos, and the mass growth is largely due to minor mergers. Another interesting class that we had is class E. Three of our 24 were like this. Um, these are due to major mergers, and they often showed very disturbed kinematics. So that included one galaxy that has a kinematically distinct core, one galaxy that has a so-called double sigma profile. So, so the velocity dispersion does not peak up at the center of the galaxy. It actually has two velocity dispersion peaks. These galaxies are very rare. They represent about 4% of the Atlas 3D sample. So that's 4% of 300 galaxies. And another interesting case we had is NGC 4365. That's the galaxy I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that rolls rather than rotates. So we also found that galaxies with a high ex situ or high accretion fac uh, fraction tended to be the ones that had older stellar populations. And they also tended to have shallower metallicity gradients. I'm not going to say too much about um, the metallicity maps that we that we derived, but here's just a quick example. So here's just a, an image of NGC 5846. See the galaxy itself and a little small galaxy down here. Here's our metallicity map. All these little circles represent our discrete data points. And we, then we've built up um, a 2D map of this galaxy. You'll notice a bunch of blue or low metallicity points down here, and they correspond to this low metallicity, low mass galaxy. So we've taken things out inside of that circle and then remade the metallicity map. And you see now that the, the contours of metallicity look, look much more realistic. And the giant galaxy is indeed has a high metallicity at its center. So from this, we can measure uh, metallicity gradients. So here's the metallicity gradients for a sample of galaxies as a function of effective radius. It's on the log. So it's all the galaxies there. And you can see that the high mass or high velocity dispersion galaxies have relatively shallow profiles, and the low mass galaxies have quite steep metallicity profiles. Something that's come up earlier in this conference too, um, Rhea Remus mentioned this gamma tote parameter. So this is the density, the total mass density of a galaxy, measuring both the dark matter and the stellar. Um, component. Here I'm plotting this as a, a function of stellar mass. So this quantity here, gamma tote, correlates quite nicely with the in situ fraction that a galaxy has. And so this is another area that we're trying to probe with the slug sample. So the red points are the data of combining Atlas 3D and the slugs data together. There's some uh, New publication, recent publication from Atlas and galaxies with H1 gas in them. That's those blue points. And then the, the green shaded region here is the magnetium simulations that, that Rhea spoke about. And she's currently working to um, do some simulations now at lower masses and see how they in turn agree with, our, with the data that we're, we're obtaining. So exciting um, area, I think. And just, I would also like to take some time to advertise this conference that I'm organizing along with others, including Jim Brody and Aaron Romanowski here, um, on uh, galaxy halos, with a particular focus on baryonic galaxy halos. So this is in the uh, Galapagos Islands in March of next year. We chose March because it's low season, so it's a relatively inexpensive time to be in the Galapagos. So if you can get yourself there, the costs are not too high. Um, There'll be some uh, Ecuadorian astronomers there also uh, attending the conference. So this is uh, an opportunity to interact with Ecuadorian astronomers. who so you probably don't get to do that very often. And Ecuador is certainly a country that's trying to grow its astronomy 
uh, group. So um, I encourage you to sign up. And um, the most important point, perhaps, is the deadline is the 27th of August. Sign up now. So in conclusion, um, talking about the slug survey, so we've been looking at the halos of massive galaxies, and we've been probing their chemodynamics out to three effective radii with the starlight directly, and then out to about 10 effective radii with the globular clusters as, as a proxy for the halos. So I showed you that centrally, slow rotators tended to remain slow as we probed further out in radius, but the fast rotators had quite a diversity of specific angular momentum profiles as we went further out. Um, high mass galaxies have shallower stellar metallicity halo gradients, and that's probably a signature that they have had more ex situ stars or an increased role of accretion in the formation of their halos relative to the low mass galaxies. And I also spoke about the assembly pathways of galaxies by comparing our 2D kinematics with those of the simulations of NAB and found that the most common assembly pathway for our early type galaxies was growth by minor mergers. Thank you. Questions for Duncan? Yep. Hi, do you see any ionized gas in any of your galaxies? Generally not. So this is a sample of early type galaxies. Um, one or two of them are known to contain some ionized gas. Um, we're working at the calcium triplet line end. You know, it's around 8,500 angstroms. So it's, ionized gas is not something that, that, that we've probed. Do you find, well, I was just asking because the LS3D sample found like, what, 70% of their early type galaxies have ionized gas? So I, I don't know, I'm sure if it's ex expecting or surprising that you may or may not have the yeah. same fraction. It's largely a function, of course, of how, how deep you go, right? So, so ionized gas or H1 content, right? If you, if you go deep enough, you'll find it even in these early type galaxies. So, yeah. So in the Atlas 3D sample, there was one peculiar subset uh, and I wondered if you have any insight on those, or if any of uh, the slugs galaxies are, happen to be those. And those are the basically non-rotating spherical systems that also tend to be very massive. How do those form? So you mean the slow rotators? Well, they are slow rotators, but there are slow rotators that are somewhat elongated, uh, not the perfectly round ones. These are the ones that uh, in the usual uh, rotation versus uh, elongation or, or Mm -hmm. uh, Prolateness plot are in the corner, on, on the right bottom hand. left corner, and uh, also, left as corner. far as we can tell, yes, uh, it seems to be more or less exclusively quite massive systems. Mm. I don't know if any of those are slugs, but uh, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head either. I have to look at that. Okay, but those, but uh, simulators have a hard time forming things like that, okay. uh, uh, and uh, it'd be interesting to have any additional information we could get on them. Mm, definitely. Okay. Thanks for highlighting that. Any other questions? Thank you. So I had one question on these high mass galaxies. I always thought if you have a creation of low mass galaxies in this context to build up their envelopes, then there should be a very strong difference in the metallicity of this envelope with respect to the central core, which is metal rich. And the envelope as it forms from dwarf galaxies or small galaxies should be quite metal poor. And you should see a strong change in metallicity at the transition point from this object that formed first and mm. the envelope that was secreted later on. And so I was wondering, do you see something like that? So I guess it's going to depend on a, on a couple of things and exactly what sort of the mass ratio of the minor mergers that is falling in, right? And so... Um, Indeed, if there's a high uh, ratio, then you're going to have lower mass things that are bringing in lower metallicity stars, and depending on where they get distributed. The other factor, I guess, is exactly where that transition radius is and whether we're actually probing it or right, not. But you can work it out where it is, which part well, was 
in situ mm. in which part was ex situ through yeah. this transition. But do but you see it? Do you see this kind of a sudden change? We, we, of we, don't, we don't see a dramatic change. And but some. You, you say mm. you, can, you can work it out, but there's actually quite a variety of predictions in the literature. You know, so, you know, illustrious has um, quite a range of effective radii where you might see a transition from your so-called in situ to, to ex situ, and it varies as a function of, of mass. Um, they would actually, I think, argue for the high mass stars, that the, the high mass galaxies, that that transition reading is that very, very small radius, which in fact should be the radius that Atlas is probing more so than, than us and other galaxies, it's way out. But um, other predictions I've seen are, have you know, completely different predictions for the, this transition radius. So one thing we would like is, yeah, good predictions, pinning it down exactly where we should be looking. And you know, do we see not just metallicity transitions, but kinematic transitions as well? Yeah. Thanks. Just to add to that, we do uh, see a couple of tr gradient transitions in a couple of the galaxies, but they're really far out. Mm. You no, know, like many, many effective radii. Yeah, so not as predicted by illustrious. Not, not, <laughs> not as predicted by illustrious, yeah. And only in a couple of cases. So you have to have good data to very large radius to see the central slope and then a flattening to large rate, which we assume would be a tr an accretion radius. But. Any more? Okay, thank you, Duncan.